watching online and if you are a newcomer welcome home i'll tell you that you probably need to not look any further because we're going to love you like we've known you forever and just really welcome you into our family and our home and so you visit once and you can be a newcomer once but then then you're just family after that so we're really glad that you're here also want to extend a very special invitation to you to join us wednesday nights this is really really important because Wednesday nights are a time is totally different than this corporate experience where we worship together as a big group. We get to break out in little groups and we get to mingle with others and build relationships in God's kingdom and be encouraged and dig way deeper into God's word. I mean, you guys know that when you discuss God's word, you get a little, a little bit more out of it than just hearing God's word, right? You participate, it becomes a part of your, your life, you get to apply it to what's going on in, in your world. And so it's a really powerful time. If you're a newcomer, we have a newcomer's life group. And so it's an opportunity where we can get to know you personally, you get to know us, and vice versa. You get to hear about where the church has been, where we're at now, and where we are headed. Now, just a little tidbit. This is kind of a... I want to keep this a secret, so don't tell anybody, all right? So, 6.30... 6.30 on Wednesday nights, that's 30 minutes before church starts, Misty and I make ourselves available to be able to just to hang out and get to know you and visit. So we're going to be in our office, 6.30. Eat whatever's in there. And there's food. Oh, wait, yes. My here. mom is an amazing, she has an amazing gift as a hostess. She loves hostessing. And she brings in fresh fruit, homemade cookies. And, and some of you all from other life groups tend to, I see you. We want don't, you. Don't think for a second that I don't sit, Grant. And other people that make their way into our office, and, and you're not a newcomer. I mean, you visit once and your family, you're not a newcomer anymore. So stop eating the cookies out of the office. Hey, right. listen, Wednesday night, I was standing at the door after service, actually, and I was standing out of the office talking to someone, and this little kid, this little beautiful little blonde girl, she comes up to me, she's just smiling, I'm talking to her for a second, I'm talking to her mom and dad, and in a minute, she goes in the office, and she's looking around, and I'm thinking, I don't know why she's looking for, you know? Like, well, the food was gone at that point. You know? She's looking so and I go, oh, oh, she knows. And that, then that's also, thing. you know, we have this beautiful, wonderful lady called Miss Ann that attends this church. And she makes some of the most amazing desserts. And then people make their way into that life group and they catch her before and after church. Just to see after church, if it's all gone, we're like, oh man, missed it. So, you know, we got good things happening Wednesday nights. You're not going to go home hungry. You're not going to go home hungry. Well, we hope to see you out here Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Hey, I want to tell you, it's not by accident that you're here this morning. That's right. If you look around this room, and this room is pretty full, you're going to know that God has a reason for you in particular being here today. From the very youngest to the oldest, God has a purpose, and He wants you to hear His word today, and we believe that with all of our heart. With God handpicked you to be in this service. So this morning, if you'll bow your head, we're going to pray as we jump in to worship Junkies Part 4. God, thank you for your presence, God, that you just surround us in this place. God, we thank you for each and every person, God, that has come today, Lord, to be surrounded by your presence and to hear your word. God, we know it's not by mistake. But God, it's by divine appointment, by your hand, that we are here. God, open our hearts now. Help us to open our minds. God, to break down the wall between us and you right now. That we can receive everything you have for us. God, if there's those who wonder, God, is, are you really real? I pray, God, right now that you show them in this place in the next half an hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Well, we have been having a really good time in this series, Worship Junkies. We've covered a lot of really cool stuff in the last three weeks. Uh, the, I want to just kind of quickly give you a, just a recap of some of the things that we've covered. The first week, we talked about how there are so many unfortunate addictions, right, that run rampant through people's lives each and every day from the most... Uh, outrageous, you know, uh, addictions, drug addictions and alcohol addictions, so unfortunate, but there's people that are just completely bound by it, all the way down to some of, you know, some of the more seemingly insignificant addictions, where maybe people just, just have to scroll through Facebook just to kind of run away or escape or make time stand still. We all have a go-to, right? And so what we talked about that first week is if you'll show me your go-to, I will show you your God, right? Whatever it is that you're running to, uh, to, to, to uh, decompress or to de-stress or whatever that thing is, I want to tell you God wants to be that very thing. He wants you to run to Him in worship, to learn to be a worship junkie and run into His presence and realize that in an instant, you can experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen? Yes. Then we talked about how there are processes to addiction, right? There are processes to addiction. And we talked about the uh, the lady at the grocery store. You know, she gives you these, these samples. And really, she's nothing more than a glorified, legalized drug dealer trying to get you addicted to these grocery store snacks. And she gets away with it each and every Saturday. I don't know how. But Sunday mornings, it's kind of the same thing because we're giving you this big taste test of God's glory and God's word. And we are trying to establish a process of addiction for you. We want you to leave this place. I remember times in my when I was in college and, and I would I'd be at church on a Sunday morning and just love and enjoy the presence of God and the worship and everything. And when it was all said and done, I'd go back to my dorm room and guess what? I wasn't done. I wasn't church may have been over, but I wasn't done having church. So I would continue to get in my word and I'd turn on more worship music. I'm like, I don't want church to stop. You know what that is? It's not church. You know what it is? It's God's presence. It's what Brandy was just talking about. It is the kingdom of heaven. And, and if you don't know this, I'm just going to let you in on a little something. Heaven is going to be pretty stinking awesome. <laughs> and I cannot wait. Is that a no-no word? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to be unbelievable. And we're trying to give you your early hit and get you addicted to become a worship junkie. Right? We've talked about a lot of things. You can't hear from God. You want to know God's will, it takes spending time in His presence. Listen to this. Real growth takes place in private worship. We're trying to get you addicted to God's presence. Amazing. Nothing, nothing like it. So get ready. Today for part four, we're going to wrap up this series. And we're praying and believing that His word is going to change your life forever. Well, today in part four in the finale, we're going to talk about the effects of worship. The effects of worship. The effects of worship. If you've got your word, go to Psalms 34 and 1. It's in the middle of your Bible. Psalms was written as basically a songbook. So where better to go to finalize our message than to the Psalms? It says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak His praises. Another way is I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Or His praise will continually fill my mouth. Before we get into really the three points that we're going to talk about today, the causes and effects of worship, I want to talk for just a moment about the fact that worship is a lifestyle. You see, when we come in on a Sunday morning, we're here for a good hour and 15 minutes. That's about it for one service. Then you go, and the next group comes in, and we do it again. Some of us, we're addicted, and we hang out for much longer. And our kids say, can we go home? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We've been here since 6 a.m. Can we leave now, please? We're like, let's go get some lunch. You know what? We're addicted, but listen to me. One hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday morning is not enough time in worship for your week. Oh, and I come back on Wednesday. That's awesome. That's only another hour. That's, if you can do math. Two hours and 15 Why did you look at me when you did that? <laughs> well, that isn't your I have best made it over and over. I've made it really clear that I'm not good at math. But that's why God gave us an iPhone. Yes. Because there's a calculator on well, there. So don't point at me when you're talking about math. Sorry. If you total 
Classic. It would only and be two, two hours and 15 minutes. Is two hours and 15 minutes enough to keep you in spiritual shape? No. If you go to the gym, two hours a week. Two hours a week. Two hours a week. Yes. Is that enough to keep you with a ripped six pack? No. No. Don't look around at your neighbor. You're rude. You are rude. <laughs> Listen to me. Praise and worship has to be a lifestyle. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Does that mean I go around singing? No. This is what it means. I will praise or I will bless. The word bless literally means to make happy. To make happy the Lord at all It means all, right? I mean, it's a Greek word. It means all. And all means all, and that's all it means. It means that at all times, in the good times, when everything is awesome, man, you go into the mailbox and there's a check you didn't expect, and you're like, yes, your kids are being good. Oh. Huh? Thank you, Jesus. Foreign, foreign, foreign. That is a foreign thing, right? In the good times and in the bad times. Right. When things aren't going so well. When the doctor has given a diagnosis that you didn't want to hear, when your checkbook doesn't quite have enough in it for the bills that are laying next to it. When things in your life just aren't adding up. See, we don't just worship God when everything goes well. Because last week we talked about the power of praise and we talked about that praise precedes victory. You want something to change in your life, you have to make worship and praise a lifestyle. It says, I will constantly speak your praises. Or another version says it this way. Your praise will continually fill my mouth. Now I want you to think about something. If I take a drink of my coffee this morning, I'm going to. This is how we're so hyper every day. Thank God for At least on right. Sunday. This is like the third cup this morning, alright? If I put that coffee into my mouth, if you notice, I couldn't talk at the same time I was taking a drink. Why? Because my coffee was filling my mouth. Listen to me. If praise is continually filling your mouth, there won't be room for anything else. If praise is continually filling your mouth, there won't be room for anything else. But when things are going bad, then you say, thank you, God, that you're still in control. God, you're still on the throne. God, everything in my life is falling apart. Everything in my life that I dreamed of is not happening right now. Everything is going wrong. But you're still on the throne. So I'm going to say thank you, Jesus, that you're in control. Because if the worst thing happened to me today and I take my last breath, I'll be promoted into heaven and that would be the best thing. So what are we really upset about? Praise has to be a lifestyle. This morning we're going to tell you the three causes and effects of worship. If you become a person whose lifestyle is all about worship, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this is what you can expect in your life. I want you to repeat after me. Say, up. Up. That was terrible. Up. Up. In. In. And out. Out. You gotta write it down. Up. Up. In. In. And out. And out. These are the three effects of worship. Worship first is going to cause you to look up. I want you to go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to tell you about this guy Isaiah. Isaiah was what was called a prophet of God. A prophet in the Old Testament was a guy who basically would go around a guy or a girl, a prophet, and they would tell what God, the, God, the message God had for people right then. All right? Isaiah was living in a day and a time when Judah and Jerusalem, the kingdom had been totally split. So the whole people of Israel, we talked about the Israelites, they got mad, basically they had a big family feud, and they separated. Okay? So now there's the kingdom of Judah, and there's the kingdom of Jerusalem. And Isaiah was living and he was preaching during that time. Alright? And so he's going out day after day after day, and he's telling them that God is telling them to repent. Repent and get right with God, because there's a wall that is separating you between you and your God because of your sin. And day after day, he would go out and he would do this. He had made worship his lifestyle. And in chapter 6, we're going to look at this incredible vision that God gives Isaiah. Go with me to verse 1. It says this. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. 
He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. I want you to just try to wrap your brain around this, all right? Each seraphim, these are angels, had six wings. With two wings, they covered their face. And with two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they flew. They were calling out to each other and proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's army. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its very foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. I want you to notice something. The very first thing that we see is it says, I saw the Lord. Isaiah was a guy who understood worship. A lot of times people are like, is God really real? If you want to know if God is really real, you've got to begin to talk to him. You've got to begin to talk to him. Isaiah was a guy who he was talking to God, he was listening. And all of a sudden, I can just imagine, he closes his eyes and he sees this vision. And he sees God on the throne. And not only does he see God on the throne, but he sees the seraphim. And it says that they had six wings. Blows your mind. Just wait until you get to heaven. You're going to freak out. You're going to freak out. I'm telling you right now. The angels were huge. They are huge. Two of them, two of the wings covered their face. Do you know why? Because of the glory of God. It was so strong that the angels themselves were covering their face. They couldn't look at him out of respect and awe of who he was. And then they began to cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That word holy literally means separated. Separated or set apart, meaning you're not like anybody else. You're completely, something completely, totally different than we've ever experienced before. And Isaiah is in awe of this picture. And then it says, that smoke filled the entire temple and it shook it at its roots. The smoke is an example, it's, it is a representation of the presence of God. Isaiah, when he started worshiping, God allowed him to see a vision. Let me tell you something, when you really begin to worship God, it will cause your focus to go straight up on Him. And as your focus is straight up on Him, He begins to reveal Himself in ways that you've never experienced before. And guess what? If your vision is up here looking at Him, I'm assuming He's up higher than we are, then you can't really be looking this way at all your challenges. Listen to me. If your focus is up, you can't look at all the junk going on around you. What we tend to do in this life, and the reason we don't live 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, day of worship, is because we get our eyes on everybody else and everything else going on in this world. Now, am I saying you should be observant of what's going on around you? No, you should. But more than that, you should have your eyes on Jesus. Worship will cause you to look up and say, God, I don't know what's going on in America, but God, I know that you're in control. God, I thank you that you are still on the throne. It will cause you in every situation, in every circumstance, to be able to worship him because he's still on the throne. And you're looking up at him. You get your eyes off the problems. You get your eyes on him. You know, the next thing that worship does is after we look up and we see God, we give our attention to God, we put our focus on God, it causes us, His presence causes us to look within. Isaiah is sitting here, he's just seen this vision of all these angels, he's kind of freaked out, he realizes how holy and how huge and how awesome God is, and what is his response? He immediately looks within, and he says this, in, in verse 5, he says, it's all over. I'm done. I am doomed. I am a sinful man. Now, was Isaiah really probably a, a, a sinful man when we think of the, the term or the definition of what sinful is? No. He was a godly man. His life, his efforts, his intentions, his attitude, his, his career, I mean, his livelihood, everything was all about serving Almighty God. He was completely dedicated to God. If there was anybody on the earth that was holy, if you will, it would have been Isaiah. But what's he say when he gets this encounter with his creator? He says, I'm done. Why? Because our righteousness is as 
filthy rags in the presence of a holy, mighty God. And he realizes in that moment that he has to now look inward and say, when I compare who I am in God's presence, I all of a sudden become extremely small and I have to survey myself. He says, I have filthy lips, and I, I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of Heaven's army. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed. Your sins are forgiven. We serve a mighty, powerful God who has the ability to take away the sins of the world. That's who we get to encounter when we come into God's presence, whether it's public, in settings like this, or whether it's private, maybe on your couch where you made your couch or your bedside and altar. You get to get in the presence of Creator God. And when you get in His presence, guess what happens? You begin to, as you look upon Him, you get to look within at yourself. And God, the Holy Spirit, has an incredible way of showing us and revealing who we really are. Here's the fact. All of us, each and every one of us in this room, we are all, even without God, we are all really good at reflection and looking within our own lives. Because our number one most favorite subject is what? Me. Right? That's your favorite subject. What's your favorite holiday? Your birthday. See? It's all about you. Right? All of us are, are driven to really just find fulfillment and pleasure, satisfaction for ourselves. Right? We're all really, really good at finding those things in our lives that please us. And looking within continually and saying, what, what can I add to my life to make me happy? What, what can I add to my, to my plans to bring me pleasure in my life? We're really good at reflecting and looking in, are we not? Yes, we are. But even without God, we're really good at this, but we're looking for what we want rather than looking at who or for whom He wants us to be. Think about that. We're really good at looking within, even without God, instead of looking at who God wants us to be. Who does God want you to be? Who does He want you to be? you got to look within. I love the psalmist David. He says, search my heart, God, and know me. Survey me. Throw me up on an operating table. Open me up and look at my heart. And then when the, when the surgery's done, tell me what was wrong with me. Just lay it all out, God. Show me. Because I want to be more like you. I want to please you. What did the scripture say? It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. How are we going to bless or make God happy? Right? By continually looking inward in times of worship. Looking at ourselves and being honest with ourselves. We Last week we talked about the scripture, John 4 and 23. And, and it talks about God is seeking those who will come to his presence, come to his throne room, right? In spirit and in truth. Those who have laid themselves out and just made themselves transparent before God. And said, Lord, search me. Know me. I come to you just as I am. And, and I want you to look me over and change my life and, and make me more acceptable. And I just want to be in your presence, God. And I want to be used by you in an incredible way. We're all really good at looking in. But let's get really good at getting in God's presence and allowing Him to look at our hearts and be honest with ourselves and be willing to mold and change our lives around who He wants us to be. I want to tell you a story. This moment in my story, it just, in, in my life, it just it, it, it changed me. It was an incredible experience. Not long after I had really given my life to the Lord at the age of 19, I got involved with this awesome church and, and had a really great group of, of, of young men that were about my age. And there's this tradition that we honor about every week. We would go out every Friday night and we would just pray. We would just go on a prayer walk. We would just we would go find some place out in the community. Sometimes we'd just go out in the woods and we would just we would just share things and transparency with one another, great accountability between men, just iron sharpening iron, trying to become more and more like Christ, trying to build our faith, trying to encourage one another. And I'll never forget, uh, it was really late at night. It was like, it was in the middle of the night. It was like 2 in the morning. And we were, uh, there was this beautiful uh, conservation park, okay? 
and we had just walked down this trail and we were out in the woods and we were just praying. I just remember deep into this, into the time that we were there, we'd been there for quite a while, and I was just laying on my back in the leaves. It was fall and it was cool. And I was looking up through the branches. All the leaves had fallen off the branches and I was looking up and, and, and you could see every single star in the sky. It was beautiful. And I had just, I had, I, we'd been there for a while, so I had just really been digging into God's presence, just really talking to God and really just worshiping Him and expressing to Him how much I loved Him and how much He was worth to me. And I'll never forget, I'm looking at the stars and all of a sudden, like this movie starts playing in my mind. But I can see it just like I can see you guys. But it's while my eyes were open, I see this picture. And, and, and what I saw was this work site where uh, there was this deep, deep, dark hole and a, uh, a fresh, big mound of fresh dirt on the other side of it. And behind me was this fire. And I couldn't see the fire. But the fire was was lighting the, uh, the, the work site. Okay? It was at night. And I remember that there was a, there was a shovel that was complete solid gold and it had a dollar sign engraved in the bevel of the shovel and it was plunged into this fresh pile of dirt and I'm sitting here looking at this picture and I'm like, I'm blown away because nothing like this had ever happened to me before and I knew it was God speaking to me I knew he was showing me something but I didn't have a clue what it meant I mean just not a clue what it meant and I just stared at this picture. It just stayed there. Like it, it, it was just burned into my mind. I saw this picture and I'm sitting there just saying, God, what, what does it mean? And after it seemed like probably half an hour, maybe only been a few minutes, but it seemed like forever. And all of a sudden, God began just kind of, um, uh, he began translating the picture to me and explaining what it meant. And he said, he said the, um, the whole the digging is where you have been at work, furiously at work. And he said the shovel that's in the dirt represents your go-to, your love for money. And he said behind you, that fire, that flame, is the presence of my spirit that's on you, that loves you, that has a plan for you. But the more you keep putting money first in your life and pursuing, you know, this prosperity, you're digging yourself a hole, a grave. Deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deeper you go, the darker it gets. And the further away you get away from my presence. And eventually, you're going to dig yourself a, a pit, a grave so deep that the, the, the light of my flame and my fire will no longer even be on your life. And it's not by my choice, but by yours, because you keep digging. You keep putting that stuff first. And I was like totally blown away. I'm like, yeah. I mean, he's absolutely right. Because I had dreams, man. I did not, my dream was not to be a pastor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this wasn't the plan. In fact, I mocked it. I told my best friend whose dad was the pastor of our church and he was the worship pastor. He said, I think that God's calling you to be a pastor. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you? That's good. That's good. Me, a pastor? Like, dude, I can outcuss anybody. Are you serious? There's no way. There's no way. I've stolen more than you can even imagine. I could open a store. With all the stuff I've stolen. I love business. I like making money. He said, no, I think God's calling me to be a pastor. I said, I will never. <laughs> you should have said that. <laughs> but I'm so glad that I am. I mean, this is my destiny. This is what I was born to do. I love it. I love it. So, um, so he was just dealing with my heart. And I said, God, what do I do? What do I do? Obviously, you and I, you know me. Yes, you're right. I love money. He said, all right, here's what you do. He said, take the shovel, your idol, your go-to, your desire, all that stuff. He said, I want you to throw it in the grave. And I want you to put your love for money to death. Pull the shovel out of the, out of the dirt, throw it in the hole. I said, how am I going to cover up the dirt? How am I going to cover up the hole? He said, look at your hands. I looked at my hands. 
He said, these hands were made not to make money and put money before me. They were made to worship me. These hands were made to love me, to express to me who I am, to you. I want to be your go-to. I want to be your everything. Bury your simple bread. Bury it now. Use the hands that I gave you to worship me. And pull that dirt over the top of the hole. It's not too late. Do it now. And literally in my mind, I took the shovel and I threw it in a deep hole. I was so close from that. It's like, you know, when you're digging this hole and there's this shadow that's cast across there and you're just inches away from disappearing in that shadow. I was inches. And I buried it. And I, I pulled that dirt over with my hands and just completely buried that shovel. Right? God, when I got in His presence, He caused me to look with Him when I got in His presence. And because of it, my life has been altered in such a way it, my destiny has now taken effect and I am who God has called me to be. We're really good at looking inward, even without God, at, at what we want rather than being really good at looking at who He wants us to be. You know what's amazing? As a pastor, I get to look at you guys all in one shot. You all just get to look at one person. I get to look at a bunch of people. Right? And all I see is destinies. Plans, God's purpose, God's amazing plans for your lives. That's all I see. Many of them unfulfilled. Many of them not yet having taken root. Many of them not come to pass yet. But it's not too late. God has a plan. There is a reason why you are breathing right now on this earth. And guess what? It's not to make money. And it's not just to breathe air. It's, it's not because of your career. It's not because of, of, of even family or travels or all the plans. And that's all great stuff. That's okay. All right? But here's the deal. God wants you here because He wants you to look up and then look within so you can look out. That's right. If you look in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, we're going to continue on. And he says this, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. When you put your focus on God and you begin to worship God and that becomes your lifestyle, your focus first goes on Him. Then it, He begins to turn it towards you. And each of us, if you, if you are walking in your destiny today, you've experienced that. But yet, it's not just a one-time experience. See, I can tell you a, a similar story of God redirecting my life. But the amazing thing is, is a daily looking in it's a daily. This is part of my prayer every single day. Just what David prayed. At the end of my prayer every day, I say, God, search my heart and show me if there be any unclean ways in me. God, anything in my life that would displease you. God, I want nothing more, God, than to make you proud every facet of my life. When you begin to do that, the third effect of worship is that you begin to look out. It's no longer about you. Because now you have the heart of God. And you begin to look out and you begin to see people everywhere you turn who are lost and hopeless. We told you before in this series that every six seconds a teenager takes their life in suicide. Every six seconds. Why? Because we live in a very hopeless world. Helpless without Jesus. See, when you begin to keep your eyes on the Father, you begin to have His heart, and His heart was this, relationship. Some of you guys were here a few months ago when we did a series on relationship. The one thing that God really wants is a relationship with humanity. Each and every single person that ever walks on the face of this planet, God wants relationship. He gave His one and only Son to give His life on the cross so that your sins could be covered and you could have relationship with God. When you begin to look up at Him, you look in at yourself and you begin to look out. You begin to say, God, it's not about me. It's not about the money I want to make. It's not about the things I want. It's not about me. What can I do for others? What can I do 
for you. And in this church, we say it this way, you love God and you love people. Sometimes, sometimes, you might end up doing things you don't even love to do. But you do it. And you realize I'm doing it because I don't do it for other people. I do it for God. The effects of worship. Guys, hear our hearts as your pastors. If there's one thing that will turn your life completely and totally upside down. You don't want to just go to church. You don't want to just sit on a cushy chair. You want your life radically changed, turned upside down. Learn how to be a person of worship. A real worship junkie, right? Your go-to, God's presence. Misty and I, I said this earlier in the series, the one thing that Misty and I have done right in our marriage, in our ministry, in our lives. Guys, we, when, when you are running like at the warp speed down a dirt road, there's going to be some rocks. And when you're running at warp speed, you're going to hit a, a little, you know, you're going to hit way more rocks way faster than you planned. And we hit a lot of rocks. A lot. <laughs> That's what we're fast. And, and, and the thing is, is, is none of us are exempt from stumbling, from, from hitting those rocks. I don't mean from stumbling in sin. I mean having challenges that we come up against daily in our lives. But here's the one thing that we've learned to do right. We run to God's presence. Like, immediately. That is our default mode. We're like, we're going to God. We're going to God. We're going to worship our way out. We're going to praise our way. Because we know that praise precedes the victory in our lives. We want victory. We want to win. Praise. Give God thanks. There's a lot of things that we can find to complain about, right? But instead, let us spend that valuable time praising God for what is going right and what He has done in our lives. David said, I would, in Psalm 84, I think verse 10, he said, I would rather be in the presence of God or in the courts of the Lord, right, for one day than a thousand days anywhere else. Now, I want you to think of the most luxurious, most peaceful, most beautiful, serene place on the planet. The most amazing place on the planet. If I told you I could put you there right now, in an instant, and you could have it, you could, you could live there. David was saying, I'd rather be in God's presence for one day than to live anywhere. Anywhere to have anything, to experience anything. I, why would he say something like that? Because he was the first worship junkie, I would say. I mean, he is like our people. He loved God's presence. He loved God's presence. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. And he messed up a bunch. I mean, we all mess up, but he messed up a bunch. Basically, right? But God still said, this is a man after my own heart. Why? Because he was a worshiper. He was a worshiper. He knew how to worship in public. And he knew how to worship in private. And God was his go-to. David knew that there was something about being in God's presence. And it's why we have said at this church, one of our core values of this church is His presence is our... Obviously, we've done a good job translating that. Why is His presence our priority? Because we know that everything's going to be just fine. As long as we get in God's presence, it's all going to work out. We give God our best, and He does the rest. Stand up with me today. My prayer, my longing in my heart is that you have gained what God would have you to gain from this series. I, I, if I could snap my fingers right now, I would, I would place within you a, a hunger that cannot be filled, a, a, a thirst that cannot be quenched, a desire for God's amazing presence because I know what it's done for my life. And I know that if you'll get a hold of what I'm talking about, you will never be the same again. We praise God not because of our circumstances, not because of everything that's going right. We praise Him because of who He is. It doesn't matter how things are going. God is good regardless. I want that to live deep in your soul. 
He is our go-to. So this morning, as we conclude this series, I want to know in this place, who's with me? Who, wants, who, who says, Pastor, I want to be a worship junkie. I, I want what you're talking about. I want God's presence in my life. I want to learn how to dig in and dig deep and know Him in a real way, right? And take Him with you. Look up, look within, and look out because the love of God in your life, His presence, is going to change people's lives around you. God wants to use you to touch people's lives for eternity. I want to pray with you right now. Would you pray with me? Let's agree together right now, together as a family. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we are eager, God, for your presence. We are hungry for your heart. We want to know you more, God. Give us, God, this, this, this drawing, this, this drive to get into your presence continually. Not just in public, but in private. Let us take... Take you home with us, Father God, and, and get into our word and, and really know how to pray and really know how to access the presence of Almighty God. Let us become best friends with your sweet spirit. You would go with us each and every day that we would welcome you into our lives every moment of every minute of every hour of every single day that we live, that we would worship you and work at home with our kids that play. We want to worship you. We want to worship you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, I want to ask you, do you have a real relationship with Jesus? You know, we here, together corporately in this building, we are experiencing God's presence right now. And if you're experiencing God's presence, it does exactly what we just said, and it causes us to look in. And this morning, as you look in and you reflect on yourself, do you have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus? Do you have that desire, that passion, to fulfill the destiny God has for your life? You see, you're not here by accident. You're not here to just suck up oxygen and make money. But God has a plan for your life, but you're never going to experience that plan if you don't first have a real relationship with Jesus. He gave His life so you can have abundant life. If you're here this morning and you would say, that's me, I don't have that kind of relationship you're talking about. It's like there's a wall between me and God. I believe He exists and I come to church. But beyond that, there's nothing there. And I want to go past that. I want that wall to come down in my life and I want to experience what you have and what I see other people experiencing. If that's you today, we want to lead you in prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to ask Him to give you that real relationship, yes. to break down the wall that's separating you and Him, that wall of sin, to never be the same person again, but to have a life change fulfill your destiny and know that if today be your last day, heaven is your home. If that's you, with every head down and every eyes closed, we don't want to embarrass anyone. But on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. As your pastors, we want to know who we're praying for and we're going to pray with you today to receive Jesus. If you're in this house and that's you on the count of three, say, I want Jesus. One, two, three. Thank you, Father. Let us see your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Church, we don't let anybody stand alone at this place. Mount Rivers Church is about doing things together and coming alongside. This morning, we're going to come alongside those who want a real relationship. Pray together with me, Father God. Father God. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Break down the wall. Break down the wall. That separated me and you. That separated me and you. I want a real relationship with you. I want a real relationship with you. I want to fulfill my destiny. I want to fulfill my destiny. That you created me for. That you created me for. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, Give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. 
You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.